Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Bodine, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here for the seventh iteration of our Diversity and Diplomacy uh, lecture series. And throughout my time in the academic world, since I left the service, uh, students from very diverse communities have raised questions about the challenges of careers in diplomacy, uh, particularly those from underrepresented um, uh, communities. And so as part of ISD's broader mandate to bring students together with practitioners uh, to better understand all the opportunities and challenges of this great career, we launched this series. And I need to give full credit uh, to uh, Caroline Savage, who is uh, one of our two Rust Fellows this year. This was her idea. She has put this together. Uh, and I'm actually just sitting in for Caroline, who happens to be out of town today. So I'm just the backup uh, moderator. But I couldn't be more pleased to be the moderator for a conversation with my very good friend and colleague, uh, Ambassador Jim Gadsden. Uh, Jim is a retired career senior foreign service officer. He was a member of our board of advisors. And as I said, he's a colleague I deeply respect and a, a friend um, I value greatly. Jim has had an extraordinary career in diplomacy. He was ambassador to Iceland, deputy chief of mission at our embassy in Budapest, counselor for economic affairs, embassy Paris, economic and political officer to our mission in Brussels, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, uh, and also Senior Advisor for European Affairs at our mission, uh, the United Nations. He was Deputy Commandant and International Affairs Advisor at the National War College as well. Since he's left the service, he has been the Senior Counselor for International Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, which is the home of the Pickering Fellows, or was the home of the Pickering Fellows. So any Pickerings in the room? Mr. Gadsden. And uh, he and I, after having a career together, uh, ended up as lecturer at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of International Affairs, where he also now still directs their Junior Summer Institute, which is a boot camp uh, for students who want to go on to graduate work and careers in international affairs. And it's six weeks, seven. seven very intensive weeks of both quantitative and qualitative analysis. Um, he has his degree in economics from Harvard and a master's in East Asian studies from Stanford. So Jim, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. A real pleasure. Bodine. I want to ask, as my first question, um, what initially attracted you to diplomacy? Um, how did you decide on this as your career? I first started thinking about a career in foreign affairs, actually, in the fourth grade. Um, at that point, we had a very uh, sort of uh, interesting and energetic teacher who introduced us to the Weekly Reader in 1958. And um, the first story in that Weekly Reader was about the launch of Sputnik and uh, what this would mean for uh, the United States and for the international community. Well, as a fourth grader, I thought that was fascinating. And that same teacher introduced us to the People to People program where we could have pen pals all around the world. Uh, when people when people wrote letters, literally by hand. And uh, I was intrigued by that and took on a little too much by getting 14 pen pals <laughs> and uh, wrote every single one of them and got responses. Much, much later, uh, when I was in high school, my world history teacher uh, really piqued my interest in international affairs. And um, by the way, he is currently the House Majority Whip, James E. Clyburn. And um, from there, went on to uh, college mm -hmm. 
where I became interested in uh, East Asian affairs, primarily because I thought my education was a bit too European uh, focused, and I wanted to know what else was going on in other parts of the world. So I decided to take the leap and go into Chinese language training and, uh, and then on for a master's in uh, East Asian studies focused on China. And at that point, uh, there were a number of people encouraging me to take the Foreign Service exam and uh, go into a State Department career. Uh, I, I took the exam, passed it, did an internship at State, and uh, immediately after graduating with my master's in June of 1972, note that that was four months after Nixon and uh, and, and Mao had signed the, uh, the Shanghai communique, which completely changed the relationship between the United States and China. Could not have been better timed. And so I, my first job in the State Department was um, in the Office of East Asian Regional Affairs. Uh, I somehow or other was not assigned overseas to do consular work, but rather to go right on into East Asian Affairs. That was the progression, but it all started in fourth grade. That's great. That is, um, that may be a new, a new record. <laughs> um, except for a few of our colleagues who were born into the Foreign Service. I think the fourth grade is just about it. Um, you mentioned uh, Congressman Clyburn. Um, could you talk about any other mentors or champions that you had uh, during your career or in the years leading up to your career? I certainly could. And I think the best mentor I had in the Foreign Service is actually in this room, it's Ambassador Mark Grossman, who um, even without trying, taught me a lot about how to do Foreign Service work well. I'd never met anyone who wrote so briefly, so concisely, so on point. And um, I decided that I was gonna mimic that skill. And I also hadn't met anyone who took such an interest in uh, all of our colleagues, no matter what the rank, and paid a lot of attention to how we treat people. Mm -hmm. I took that practice on into my later Foreign Service work, and, um, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it was very, very su successful. I also um, owe him a debt of gratitude because he invited me to come back to be one of his Deputy Assistant Secretaries of State in the European Affairs Bureau. And as far as I know, that was one of the first uh, major efforts to bring diversity at a leadership level into the European Affairs Bureau. That's great. Well, Mark, thank you. And thank you for joining us today. We'll get you up here um, in a later one. Um, you, you, you mentioned, you know, Mark bringing you on as DAS as, as, and as one of the steps forward in diversity and inclusion in the department. Um, how do you see yourself and how do you think others see you within the foreign affairs world? Um, in what ways, and I use the plural, uh, do you identify yourself and how do you think that, that affected your approach to your work and how others worked with you? I don't really see myself because I don't really think about myself. Never really have. Uh -huh. Rather, I zero in on the work that I'm doing at the time. And it doesn't matter whether it's in academia or in foreign service work. Uh -huh. I find out as much as I can about the tasks that I'm to carry out. And then I try to do the very best I can to perform those tasks well. And um, sometimes I use methods that are a bit creative and uh, unusual, mm -hmm. and sometimes I get slapped on the wrist uh, for doing so. Uh, and in a number of cases, some of the things that I reported on from overseas turned out to be right when others thought earlier that they were wrong. Um, and I think to my surprise, uh, there were people paying attention to what I was doing and how I was doing it. Uh, without my even knowing it, and who um, offered me opportunities that I never saw coming. So I think, um, I think the key thing was that I didn't focus on myself. I just wanted to do the work that I love so much. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do it to the best that I could and let the rest fall into place. Yeah, I, 
understand that. You've, you've talked about your mentors before the, the service, and um, very nice uh, shout out to Mark um, during your career. Um, how have you been trying to pay that forward uh, since you've left the service? Um, I, I mentioned, you know, you, you are doing, let me rephrase it, you are doing so much to pay it forward. Uh, could you talk about some of the programs and, and efforts that you have undertaken to help others? Mm -hmm. Well, it was very clear to me that there were people paying attention to my work and who saw that perhaps I could advance in my career with opportunities that they saw for me, <laughs> things that I didn't see for myself. I thought I would pay, pay that forward by trying to help young people interested in foreign affairs, interested in a State Department career, to see themselves in positions that perhaps they did not think of by themselves. Uh -huh. um, and so <clears throat> while I was in the Foreign Service, I certainly did a lot of that. And after I left, uh, I thought that I would continue doing that in along a number of different fronts. And certainly uh, at Princeton, when I uh, retired and started teaching there, uh, for the young people who were interested in the State Department, we gave uh, workshops mm -hmm. every now and then where we went through, of course, the full process for applying and, um, and how to do that well, including how to write the narrative and, mm -hmm. and how to prepare the resume. But we also talked a lot about why would you want to do a Foreign Service career? And, um, and brought out, of course, the standard approach to this, namely contributing to uh, advancing the nation's interests, mm -hmm. but also looking at what kinds of interests of one's uh, own right. one would want to follow and benefit from. Mm -hmm. And then doing a comparison of the kinds of benefits that come aside from professional development, intellectual development, that come from being in the Foreign Service. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. you know, life insurance, health insurance, <laughs> education right. for children, apartment paid for by the government, um, home leave. If you compare that to benefits in the corporate world, aside from what you can contribute in a substantive way to advancing the nation, there are a lot of ways in which one can benefit in one's personal life and family life. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that kind of a comparison is uh, what one probably would not hear in a normal briefing on the State Department, the Foreign Service, and so on. So we did that. And later became involved with uh, the Pickering Foreign Affairs Fellowship Program, basically expanding the recruitment effort uh -huh. by going to a lot of places that had not been uh, paid sufficient attention, I uh -huh. think. Uh, including some of the uh, the uh, the HBCUs, mm -hmm. like for example Lincoln University, which has a very very distinct history. And the first time I went there to recruit, no one had been there in 12 years from the State Department. And the net result was we have now two young ladies uh, in the Foreign Service as a result of those efforts. And then we went on to. Uh, places like Dearborn, Michigan, mm -hmm. which has a very large uh, Arab-American community mm -hmm. uh, with Muslims and Christians. Mm -hmm. And I expected not to get a good reception there, but that was the largest audience that I had anywhere in the U.S., mm -hmm. about 75 people, and I asked them, uh, why, <laughs> why are you, are you so... <laughs> and their response was, we believe that we bring cultural knowledge a knowledge of the history of these areas, the language, and we believe that we can help our country uh, to conduct its foreign policy uh, a lot more judiciously uh, with our expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, a number of them are now in the Foreign Service. Um, in expanding the Pickering Fellowship Program effort, uh, the department asked me to create a professional skills development workshop and so uh, we did that 
uh, for about five, four or five years. And um, one of our mentors in that effort is Miss Maria Pinto Carlin, who took part uh, each year. Um, and um, then we had counseling sessions with the students, uh, with the fellows, uh, on how to go about choosing summer internships. Uh -huh. You know, what are the objectives you ought to seek? How do you go about navigating that process? Uh, what do you want to walk away with when that experience is over? And how does that fit into your career development? This was close counseling that tied uh, very neatly with the formal mentoring workshops, the career development, skills development workshops. And um, <clears throat> I believe that in these ways, we uh, helped a number of students to get on a good track for launching their careers and hopefully carrying forward in their work some of the skills and insights that they picked up mm -hmm. through exposure to uh, mentors and speakers like Maria Pinto Carland and, uh, and uh, Bernadette Min and, and a number of others who uh, took part in that mm -hmm. process. So I see that as, as carrying the effort forward. Right. Well, and I think certainly the work you do with the uh, junior Summer Internship uh, Institute as well. Um, I would say that yes, you have more than paid it forward uh, and continue to. And I will do a, a very small brief aside that we're recruiting uh, Ambassador Gadsden to help us set up a new scholarship here at the School of Foreign Service in the name of Ambassador Don McHenry, uh, where we're going to draw on this background with Pickering and uh, Junior Summer in, in Institute uh, to really bring it, bring it more to, to uh, SFS. Um, what are some of the other changes and, um, in policy and approach that you've seen in state, maybe the foreign affairs community more broadly, on trying to re not just recruit, but to retain, promote, move forward to the senior levels, a much more diverse and, and inclusive um, core of practitioners than you and I knew when we first came in. Mm -hmm. I think there was an assumption on the part of a number of students from diverse community, young Foreign Service officers from diverse communities, that when they're in the Foreign Service, they should really go to foreign assignments that connected with their ancestries. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is not a good approach. I think a better approach is to keep in mind that they are representatives of all of America and not their uh, ethnic groups. And that they should go anywhere they wish that the department wants to send them negotiating that through proper channels and into functional areas, whether it's nonproliferation or uh, economics or environmental affairs, as global representatives of the United States, states, regardless of their ethnic backgrounds. I think there was also the assumption when I came in on the part of a, a number of people that they should shy away in the department from the bureaus that um, were sort of thought of stereotypically as, well, that's not for us. Right. And I think the European Bureau was perceived uh, as, mm -hmm. as, as, as one of those. In my own experience, I found that that was not the case. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure how this happened, but a very long time ago when I was in Taiwan, the European Bureau actually reached out to me there and told me that they would like me to go from Taiwan to Budapest <laughs> via 10 weeks, 10 months of say. Hungarian, <laughs> <laughs> Hungarian language training. Right. I don't know why they did that, but they did. And uh, lo and behold, um, I didn't find the European Bureau to be intentionally exclusive at all. Mm -hmm. um, passive, perhaps. Yeah. But that changed when Ambassador Grossman came in as Assistant Secretary. Mm -hmm. He launched uh, a very energetic effort to recruit talent from other bureaus in mm -hmm. the department. Uh, if for no other reason, of course for uh, enhancing diversity, 
but also because what do we talk with the Europeans about most of the time? It's about other parts of the world mm -hmm. where we have issues and challenges. And in order to do our work as best we could with them, why not draw in diverse knowledge and diverse talent mm -hmm. from people who have experiences in these other bureaus and in other parts of the world? And I thought that was, at least to my knowledge, one of the first non-passive efforts yeah. on the part of the European Bureau uh, that confirmed, at least in my mind, that it was not an exclusive bureau, mm -hmm. no matter what the perception might have been. That effort was carried on years later by uh, one young lady that, who came and sought me out, who was a, uh, a, an acting assistant secretary at the time, uh, Masha Yovanovic, mm -hmm. uh, who um, told me that she wanted to meet with the Pickerings who were interning in the State Department during that summer because she wanted to get them interested in planning to come into the European Bureau as soon as possible. And her philosophy was, and she said this directly to them, I want to grow diversity mm -hmm. in the European Bureau. I want officers at the beginning of their careers to grow their uh, professional skills, their knowledge base in the European Bureau mm -hmm. so that over a period of years, they can look towards leadership levels within that Bureau mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of suddenly deciding, oh, we're not diverse. We better go out and find some go diversity. Find somebody. Yeah. yeah, and I thought her approach made uh, a tremendous amount of sense, and that I saw as being a major change, certainly from when I came in. Right. And by the way, the um, the Thursday luncheon group yes. is carrying out this effort with all of the other bureaus mm -hmm. uh, in the State Department. Yes, um, I think there has been tremendous change. Um, you, you have painted, a, I think, a very accurate and very positive um, portrait of the State Department and what it's been, what people like you and Mark and others have been trying to do, but I'm sure it hasn't all been smooth for you, probably not smooth for everybody. What were some of the major challenges that you faced um, personally, professionally in this career? And what kind of tools and resources did you draw on to handle those? The first major challenge, I wouldn't even call it major, but let's say the first challenge I faced was when I was working in the Office of European Regional Affairs in the early 80s, the Bureau decided, and our ambassador in Brussels at the U.S. Mission to the European Communities at that time, George Vest decided, that, uh, that they wanted me to have my next assignment at the U.S. mission to the uh, European communities. I went to my career counselor, who supposedly is one who helps. Uh, the emphasis is on the word supposedly there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to move along in their careers. And told him uh, what the situation was and what my plan was. And, uh, asked him to kind of help me get on track for this. His first question to me was, do you have French? And so I said, well, yes, I do. And his uh, response was, well, I don't see it on your personal audit report. And so I said, look, French is not a problem. You know, in high school in New York, I had a Belgian teacher and simultaneously a teacher from Paris from the Lycée tradition. And uh, by the time we finished 12th grade, we had gone through Sartre, Camus, Marot, and uh, the 20th century <laughs> philosophers, got a 680 something on the SAT twos and got exempted from foreign languages for college. So you'll see that I have Chinese down there, two plus two, and um, uh, two plus two plus, and Hungarian three plus three. Give me a two-week refresh, refresher in French, and I'll give you a 3-3. Three, three. And the, uh, the counselor sort of looked at me and said, uh, well, take the test now, and let's see. 
in the and, room, like right now, then in in yes. his office. No, well, no, not oh. in the office. Oh, but okay. Take the test within the next. Yeah. Okay. Several days, and let's see. Well, I was very upset by this, and uh, went home, talked it over with my wife, who sort of said, "Well, you still have your high school textbooks. Come home every night. I'll do everything. You spend time brushing up on your French, and then go take the test." So I did that, and um, I went back and uh, had a wonderful test, about two and a half hours. And you know, we started kidding around with the examiners and just having a great old time till about seven o'clock in the evening. And finally they said, look, we got to go home. You got your 3-3. Three, three. So I asked them, could you write that up right now? And I said, no, nah, we'll send you the paper. I said, no, I need it right now. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, they did it. The next day I went by my counselor, threw it in front of his face and told him, Move the assignment forward, or I will go several levels above your head and have it done. That's and, one uh, set of tools. <laughs> he quivered, <laughs> uh, but he, he put the assignment through. Good. Went on to Brussels and started working on development issues at the mission. When the ambassador told me uh, several weeks later, I want to move you to a different area. You know, we're getting ready for a lot of major changes in the EU and I want you to be reporting on that. So I said, but what about my job that I'm doing on development? He said, don't worry. We have someone, an officer identified. Uh, she's now in French language training. Uh, she'll be coming out to replace you. And, um, and, uh, but if you can carry both jobs for a while, uh, that, would, that, would be, uh, that would be very helpful. So I said, okay. Uh, three weeks later, um, the test, the uh, successor took the test, didn't pass, didn't get a 3-3. She was a French language major. Um, so they asked me to hold on another two or three weeks. I did. She still didn't pass the test. Do you know what the system did? Downgraded the, lang the language requirement to 2-2. Two, two. And I thought to myself, all I wanted was a two-week refresher to get the 3-3, three, three. Yeah. how is it that they downgraded the language yeah. requirement for the job to accommodate this person? That told me right away that I operate under a different set of rules. Mm -hmm. That happens to be a fact. There's no point being angry about it, it's just reality. Uh, so now that I understand what the reality is, I will then change my way of behaving mm -hmm. to uh, overcome that mm -hmm. and not with uh, not with any uh, sort of um, vindictiveness yeah. or anything but that's the reality that is a fact and right. deal with it yeah um, how would you how would you actually advise and counsel a we have a lot of people here who aspire to and will be uh, junior officers soon enough uh, when they run into something like this um, where the standards are slightly different the rules of the game are slightly different yes how would you advise them to to handle that I mean you handled it well but how would you advise one of the our, our, our almost JOs here to handle something like that I would advise them to in the first instance, don't resort to anger. That gets you nothing, but it also creates a perception by others mm -hmm. that you're an angry person, you're very difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. Now get angry. <laughs> Second thing I would suggest is talk with others, uh, either in the Thursday luncheon group or the Black American Ambassadors uh, Association, um, about their experiences and how they handled them, how they got around them. Because there, there are certain realities that you will never change, but you have to figure out how to manage so that you don't destroy your enthusiasm for the career mm -hmm. and so that you can, can move forward. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I would suggest is what I suggested at the beginning. Always try to excel at what you do. Do the very best that you can so that no one can challenge you on competence. Mm -hmm. You know, and even there, I would suggest 
you know, putting in a few extra hours, yeah. little extra effort at home, do your rehearsing if you're going to be presenting de marches, and um, think through how you're going to approach things and think very strategically. You know, if I want to get from here to point A, mm -hmm. what do I need to do? And then get advice on best ways to navigate towards right. what you want to achieve. But never get angry, never express anger, figure out ways to work around the obstacles that you face. Mm -hmm. I think that's excellent advice. Um, and it's not always easy to follow, but it's the right advice to have. Um, that counting to 10 that our grandmothers always told us to do was absolutely right. And in some cases, it may be 15 or 20, uh, but just keep counting. Mm -hmm. um, given, as, as you said, there are realities that we're still dealing with. Um, there are some, it has not become, we haven't seen all the changes that we hoped to see when we were junior officers ourselves. What would you recommend to state or to others institutionally on how to move the culture, the environment forward a little bit more? What's, what are some of the next steps that need to be taken? Mm -hmm. I think at leadership levels, um, particularly the director general, mm -hmm. uh, and we have a very good director general yeah. now, I would have a close conversation, perhaps one where the, AV, the American Black Ambassadors Association uh, invites her to lunch or the Thursday luncheon group and have an honest conversation, and she is open to honest dialogue, about uh, some of the perceptions, and by the way, you know, usually junior officers mid-level, the whole array of uh, career levels mm -hmm. will usually take part in these events, have an honest conversation about how these officers at different levels perceive that they are either uh, included, partially included, excluded, ignored, not considered for advancement, and, um, and so on, or if they perceived bias. Have an on, honest conversation about that and get attention at that level and have some recommendations on how some of these mm -hmm. things can be addressed, whether it means um, a set of workshops within the various bureaus, uh, and not just the geographic bureaus, but the functional bureaus as well, mm -hmm. or whether it's training at FSI, mm -hmm. whether it's mandatory training at FSI, whether it's included as a part of leadership training at FSI, mm -hmm. but to have the signal come from the top yeah. that we have perceptions of bias that we need to overcome. Not uh, even just perceptions of bias, there is still actual, bias. Yes, and, um, and that you are required as uh, mm -hmm. managers, leaders, or even individual officers to take part in, uh, in these workshops. Uh, to sensitize folks to, um, I would say, sometimes um, not deliberate necessarily, but unconscious behavior mm -hmm. that can affect morale and, uh, and, uh, yeah. and that can affect uh, advancement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would be willing to bet that, you know, the career counselor who was so difficult in giving you, you know, the French language that you asked for, if, if you had challenged him, he would not be aware right. of the bias mm -hmm. uh, that was implicit mm -hmm. in what he did. I think that's right. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes trying to understand the difference between the wholly implicit bias that is still bias. Mm -hmm. And how do you get at that? And maybe that also goes back to not getting mad. Yes. Uh, but getting engaged. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, you and I can talk for hours at a time, so I will stop. Do you have any, I'm gonna open it up to some questions and comments uh, from our, our sure. audience, if, if uh, I might. Mm -hmm. So, does anybody? Uh, you, you may. This is uh, one of our Rust fellows. Oh, good. So this is. Uh, hey, it's Roland McKay from ISD. I'm curious um, if you could give us some insights into how you developed your writing 
early on? Did you seek out mentors? Was it just the nature of the process through the editing of your work that you became a good writer? Or was there, were there turning points in particular? How did, obviously, that's the mark of success on down. How did you develop your writing skills? Thank you. I didn't really seek out uh, mentors for writing. I just come from graduate school into the Foreign Service where some of the courses, one of which was historiography, um, the writing of history, where we had to review um, 5,000 pages of reading a week and write a one-page critique of that, uh, of that uh, reading. And so very early on, we were forced to condense, to try to seek the core of, uh, of the uh, points that we wanted to get across and then to get them across clearly. So there was a good base there already. And in the Foreign Service, had the advantage of having some very accomplished uh, Foreign Service officers early on who would take my writing and then edit it down even further. Um, I did a lot of note taking for the Assistant Secretary for East Asian Affairs at the time, who uh, was just masterful at this and who would literally, I mean, he wouldn't mark it up and send it back through some anonymous channel. He would call me up and we would sit down at the coffee table and he would literally go through and say, we don't want to say it this way. You have some useless phrases here that don't really contribute very much. You need to cut that out. Mm -hmm. And two years of that practice built upon uh, the work that I'd already done in grad school was very helpful. And then, uh, of course, uh, overseas, where having started my career in Washington first, I had a pretty good idea of how Washington consumed information. And so I was very much set not to send back the equivalent of what we used to call airgrams, these very long <laughs> essays, because the I knew New that... New Yorker article-like exactly. things, yes. I knew nobody would read them. And then, you know, going on in the career, when I got to Ambassador Grossman's office, I condensed that even further when I saw how concisely he wrote, you know, not a word wasted. And I just kept building upon that over, over time until it became almost second nature. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you for... Hi. Hi, thank you for joining. Um, I'm Millie Kim and I'm in from the SFS and as an undergraduate student aspiring to enter the Foreign Service one day, I'm curious what skills have you found most important and helpful for navigating the world of diplomacy in addition to writing? <laughs> okay. Remember now I told you sometimes I take some different kind of creative approaches. Quantitative analysis. Um, at the mid-career level, I, uh, I went to Princeton to do a year uh, of economics training. And I had one of the toughest quantitative analysis courses I'd, I'd ever. Are you taking quant? Good, <laughs> okay. And um, the thing that I picked up from quant was that sometimes you can think of international affairs challenges as um, as regressions, where there are certain terms and coefficients that govern the behavior of that regression. And then there are others that, you, that are interesting, but don't really matter that much, and so you can toss them out. And I find myself from time to time, when I'm forced to write on a challenge, to think about what are the governing terms here? What are the governing dynamics? And I'll list them out, and then I'll think them through and figure out which are significant and which are not, so that I can wind down to some writing that's pretty condensed and really focused on what really, really matters. And if people have questions later about why I didn't treat this or that, then I can answer it but it, it keeps the focus right there. Um, so, uh, and you'll find in the Foreign Service that, that writing is important in that sense. 
speaking and oral presentation is also very important in that sense, especially if you want to hold your audience and give them two or three key messages to walk away with. Okay? Did, did that address? Yeah? yeah? Okay. <laughs> I'm also an undergraduate in the SFS, and uh, I think I'm in uh, the midst of applying to internships and stuff like that, and uh, kind of seeing that maybe some of them are not going to turn out. So, what do you rec like? Do you have any uh, advice for people who maybe don't get the internship they want, and like how to maybe turn jobs that maybe are not so, uh, I guess, traditional to uh, your story of getting into the into the foreign uh, foreign service. Mm -hmm. Okay, my suggestion there in the first instance is to, in addition to the internship that you really want, think of three or four others that would fit the bill for what you're trying to do or trying to gain some experience in and apply for those as well. Um, that would be my first suggestion. And in that regard, um, I don't know if it's still around, but Careers in foreign affairs? Yeah. Oh, but it, but it is, oh, so it still exists. Okay. Careers in foreign affairs. Uh, please look, is it still done in the same format pretty much? Yeah. Uh, find careers in foreign affairs. And uh, if it's still done the way Ms. Pinto Carlin used to do it, uh, it will give you good advice on, on what opportunities there are in different categories. Uh, certainly the national security agencies, but also nonprofits, the private sector, international organizations, just to stimulate your own thoughts on what might be interesting and closely related to the internship that you want but may not get. Now, and apply for a whole bunch of them. Okay? The other thing you might want to do is to look at, um, at uh, perhaps NGOs where you may not be paid for the work, but where you gain experience um, for, uh, for volunteering, okay? But have an array of possibilities uh, that, that, that may help you develop the skills and experiences that you need, even if it isn't exactly what you want. Yeah. But check out that publication. Yeah? Okay. Over here. Yeah. Hello. My Hi. name is Zanessa Nbeta. I'm a second year in the MSFS program. Hi. I'm also a Ringel Fellow who will be entering the Foreign Service in September. Good. Thank you so much for sharing, um, sharing your comments. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice on um, best practices when you're transitioning throughout your career in the Foreign Service, when you arrive at a new place, new post, new faces, if you ever kind of had certain practices that you would routinely do when arriving at a new place in your career. Good question. I, yeah. yeah. The first thing I would try to do is, is get settled. Get in place everything that you need uh, to function easily. And that means not only in your office, uh, but also in your home. So that you're not always spending time adjusting to things while trying to carry out your work. So you want, to, you want to get settled first and foremost. Sorry? Unpack fast. Yes, very much so. The second thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, get as complete an understanding of your job description and have a good conversation with your supervisor of what that job description means what the tasks and expectations are under each area that's outlined for you. And, um, and then ask, are there any other expectations that you would have of me, right? And then the next thing is, be sure to keep a record of what you do and, uh, and how you did it so that when you um, have your quarterly reviews and do plan to schedule them with your supervisor because your supervisor is going to be busy and will not be thinking about it. 
And when your EER time comes around, your evaluation time the following spring, pull out the notes that you kept, uh, including what you did to try to improve in areas where your supervisor suggested that you improve, and give a complete set of notes to your supervisor to prepare your evaluation because your supervisor eight months later or ten months later is not going to remember. And the last thing you want, forgive me Mark, <laughs> the last thing you want is for your supervisor to be on his or her own writing your report <laughs> without some sort of reminders. They okay. Can't. So, and, and you can always present that as a way of helping your supervisor because you know your supervisor is very busy. And it's true, it's really true. But also it's a way of keeping track of what you're doing and whether you're meeting the expectations, including the suggestions for improving. The third thing I would suggest is um, get out and around. Mm -hmm. Now that, that's maybe in some places today that's a little difficult because from the time that I was working overseas, the security situation is completely different. Uh, but to the degree that you can, you know, get to meet people in uh, different, uh, different tracks of life in your society, some that are related to what you're going to be doing, some that are not, the cultural scene, um, your diplomatic counterparts from different parts of the world, get to know them and talk to people about their perceptions of what's going to be your area, economics or Okay, so you have the perfect entree right there. And um, talk to people about their perceptions of the kinds of things that you're interested in that uh, impact U.S. interests. How do they see things developing? Uh, and compare notes and have lunch with, with, with folks from time to time. Um, same thing with the host government, unless there are security reasons that prevent you from from doing so. Uh, the next thing I would suggest is uh, don't rely so much on emails. You know, do some of that, but have person-to-person -person contacts. Um, the value of that in terms of observing body language, eye movements, facial expressions, the angle of the head tilt, yeah? <laughs> All these kinds of things tell you a lot about what the person is saying and the degree to which you may or may not be able to trust that. Um, and then the other thing is, unless the security situation is different, uh, go to supermarkets, hang out, mm -hmm. uh, take the subway, you know, um, ride the trams, and um, you know, just exchange courtesies with people and see how they react to you uh, and so on. But get as fully involved in the society not to mention in the embassy or the post with your uh, diplomatic, your American diplomatic uh, counterparts and the foreign diplomatic counterparts as well. You want to develop as comprehensive an understanding of the society that you're in and the context in that society for the issues that impact U.S. interests so that you can convey your analyses in as complete and full but concise a form as you possibly can. Those would be my suggestions. Yeah, and just to kind of flip that over a little bit, I think where people do themselves a disservice in terms of both professionally and personal is they confine themselves to their section. Uh, they don't get out of the economic section. They don't get out of the PD. They don't know who these, they don't know who their colleagues are in the rest of the building. Uh, the rest of the embassy. They don't know what they're working on. They don't know what their priorities are. And a lot of times, what they know may have a great impact on, particularly if you're doing PD, you really need to know what everyone else is doing. But don't become a prisoner of your section. Don't become a slave to your job. I mean, this is in a room full of people who, you know, will work 18 hours a day if, if given half a chance. But still try not to become, you know, completely consumed by your job, get out of the American community, um, much as it's, it's lovely. Um, personally, I'm not even sure, you know, the diplomatic community can also just be a bubble. 
Um, and so the further out you can get, um, the better. If you're in a place where it's very, you know, I, I, I didn't even, where I served, we didn't even have trams and subways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's a nice idea, but um, one, <laughs> one way that you can, you can kind of get out if there are real security issues is, you know, be the note taker to the section chief, the DCM, the ambassador. Um, you're seeing the world at the level that they see it, but you're getting out, you're getting, you're hearing the issues, the most important issues, and you can learn so much mm -hmm. from, you know, being that person who everyone can count on and gets, to, gets things done. Um, but yeah, be as proactive and as far as you can get. Mm -hmm. And when you, you mentioned when you get to post, when you get to post, to take Ambassador Bodine's point a bit further, uh, and you're going around introducing yourself, let it be known that you would like to be the note taker. You know, that shows a degree of initiative, but it also accomplishes what Ambassador Bodine just mentioned. Uh, hello, thank you for Hi. speaking with us. Uh, my name is Amina Ihaya. I am in the MSFS program. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk, um, one of the emphasis on in MSFS is on ethics and um, decision making. Um, could you talk a little bit about like the values that you hold dear and how they've helped you, um, how they've guided you when you've had to make um, tough decisions? I got to meet. Uh, tough decisions or difficult decisions that weren't necessarily clear cut. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Excellent yeah. question. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Fortunately, I never really had a values challenge while I was working. Um, during a lot of my career, uh, human rights was uh, certainly a part of the concerns that we, uh, that we had. Um, respect for religions and cultures and uh, rule of law and so on were very, very prominent at the time, most especially when I was in Budapest as, as DCM in the 94 to 97 period where our entire emphasis there was on helping Hungary make the transition from communism, complete the transition, I should say, from communism to democracy and market economy. And so in terms of values, Certainly, um, you know, we got a chance to try to advance uh, some aspects of, 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 of those uh, considerations, um, particularly in areas that one might not think about, uh, fact-based journalism. So, and we had a lot of USIA instruments at the time that we could use to bring experts over to help the Hungarian press move towards fact-based journalism. Um, the respect for uh, individual rights and rule of law, we had a big problem of, um, of uh, extortion in, uh, in Hungary at the time where uh, policemen would stop foreign business representatives in particular on the highway because they knew these people had money and access to money, uh, smashed their tail light and then charged them some exorbitant amount of money and, uh, and so on. Uh, mistreatment of minorities. And um, we addressed that by uh, bringing over people to help develop their justice system uh, and uh, also to train their police in the responsibility of the police to the citizens as opposed to the citizens being uh, sources of money for corrupt police. And I was particularly happy to be involved in that one because uh, I was able to bring over the police chief from my hometown, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, who uh, in his own law enforcement efforts around uh, the city of Charleston uh, was um, uh, didn't really go around in a cruiser. He went around on rollerblades, <laughs> and he did not carry a gun, uh, and um, you know did his his arresting in his his own way. Um, he was a PhD in international affairs. Uh, he was a black man. He was also Jewish, 
And the idea of bringing diversity in that sense uh, to Hungary, which had its own problems with diversity, and having this man uh, teach at the FBI and State Department sponsored International Law Enforcement Academy in Budapest, a way of carrying this transition forward, uh, carried its own message without our having to actually do it with a heavy hand. So uh, in that period, um, it was a very exciting time to try to promote the values that, that we hold dear. So I never really, really had a difficult challenge there. Uh, now, under different circumstances, particularly that involved, let's say, uh, bombings in Cambodia or um, in other parts of the world where uh, some of our foreign service officers objected to the policies. You know, I've always seen this as kind of a situation where an individual may have two or three, at least two or three choices. You know. Um, if the policy is offensive, um, one can either resign and, uh, and satisfy one's own um, concerns about that policy, or one could um, wait for the pendulum to swing, and the pendulum does swing. You know, it may swing around election cycles or it may swing around the administration at the time. It doesn't matter whether it's Democratic or Republican. Uh, coming to the realization that this policy that we've been carrying out is not working. We need to do something else. But the pendulum does swing. Um, a third choice that some have taken is to resign in a big flare and uh, make a big pronouncement which gets about 30 seconds of press time and then the, uh, the protestation and the person is forgotten, period, and the policy remains the same. So I think it's an individual choice. My own personal choice was to watch the pendulum and nothing has happened that I found personally so outrageous that I would resign and, uh, and make a big... Uh, uh, a big pronouncement, uh, but rather to wait until our society reached the point where um, they they didn't want the policy to continue, and the administration at the time moved on to a different approach. So those are the kinds of um, ethical problems that were of great value to work on the transition in Hungary. And the other ones uh, that uh, others found very, very objectionable and took different routes to uh, approach those, those policies. And, uh, and then my own choice, namely to, to wait out. What is not acceptable ethically is to sign on as carrying out the president's foreign policy and providing the best advice you could whether or not that advice is accepted by our superiors in state or elsewhere, agreeing to do that, and then going out to the press and trashing those policies, that in my view is not ethical. If you disagree that much, leave. Can I just add one mm -hmm. um, element to that? I just want to pull out on one, one point is you do, I mean, you are being hired for your intellectual skills. We do not hire FSOs for their brawn, uh, thank goodness. Um, but we are hiring you because you can think, you can analyze, you can make recommendations. This is, this is what we're looking for. People who can look at a policy, come up with a policy recommendation, see where a policy is fulfilling the goal that was it was designed to fulfill or where it's not where it might either be neutral or even counterproductive um, you have the ability and i think you have the obligation to be able to send through the system what your views on this policy are and what the cost of that policy is and what the alternative approaches are um, and you know 
so you talked about the pendulum sw shifting because the administration understands that the policy that they're uh, for f they're following is not working. Somebody is part of the conversation mm -hmm. to let them know this is not working. This is not, you know, I accept your broad goal, but this is not the best way to go about it. And I will assure you, having been in, uh, in different parts of the world and working on different issues, that yes, my job was to represent and articulate U.S. policy as it was decided, absolutely. But my obligation equally was within the service, within the State Department, to make it clear that, you know, yes, this is the policy, and yes, I did explain this to the, the host government or whomever, but you need to understand, she said a little bit more nicely, you need to understand this isn't working. And it's not only not working, it's counterproductive. And that is your job, that is your obligation. The question becomes, is it a difference in policy approach and you have an argument about that and you give your best analysis and your best views? Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. And you have to decide, is this a red line issue or is this a policy debate? One thing you will also learn is that sometimes you will have a view on a policy and it turns out the other guy's right. Um, I've been involved in some knockdown, drag out bureaucratic battles in the department where I lost, and in retrospect, I was wrong. And so a little humility on one side and a little bit of courage on the other side, as your job is to sh help shape that policy. If it gets to a red line, then you have to make a decision. But your part, you know, I was, a, you know, use your inside voice, if you like, and help shape it. You're not passive, be active. And there are a lot of structures that allow this to take place. Um, uh, several levels of interagency working groups and deliberative bodies on a given policy. So there are ample ways to do this before one gets to the level of do I quit or do I go to the press or what have you. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Ben Thompson. I'm an undergrad in the SFS. So thank you for speaking with us today. Um, as has been said, this room is full of people that like to work 18 hours a day. Um, I'm not sure we like to. <laughs> that work 18 hours a day. Yes. This, uh, this career clearly involves a lot of personal investment. Um, how, how do you personally cope with instances where after putting so much effort into something, you don't achieve the goal that you had set, or you don't have the impact that you feel you should have. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes, long hours are involved. And um, in terms of personally coping, and I take it you're thinking about family situations, impact on family, or, or are you not? About on, on the policy. Morale. You've, yeah. you've, you've killed yourself for this policy and they didn't buy it or it failed. Oh, I see. Okay. You've got yourself off. Well, I th <laughs> sorry. Nothing. Well, I, <laughs> I think it's important to keep in mind, and I say this having listened to a number of students in a number of different fora in a, at a number of different institutions. Um, it's important as a student to realize that when you start out on your career, you are not going to change policy. Rather, you become a part of a deliberative process where you contribute to the dialogue. So starting out, um, I think you can avoid a lot of frustration by setting aside the notion that you're going to change policy. That's not going to happen right away. Yeah. That said, um, once you realize that uh, arriving at a policy sometimes takes a lot of time and a lot of deliberation and a lot of levels, and what you would do at the entry level, let's say you're, you're on a, an interagency working group, then once your group comes up with a set of 
recommendations and options for approaching a policy goes up to another level and that may be sent from that level to another level before it gets to uh, a, a final decision making process. So you are contributing to a process. Uh, if, you, if you approach it that way that you are contributing, um, even the long work hours, which often merits uh, the effort, um, even the long work hours will probably not frustrate you. But if you come from the approach that you're expecting to change policy right away, um, the 18 hours could frustrate you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And then we're going to then start wrapping it up a little bit. Yeah, just really quickly, because um, we had talked about a uh, workplace, how discrimination against uh, us, like if we, how to react to those situations, but how about as a bystander, like if we're seeing other people or colleagues in the workplace uh, having, like, being treated unfairly, like, what do you recommend doing uh, to not just be a bystander, like a passive bystander, right. to be part of that change or just a part of the solution? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you could do, I would think, at least two things. Uh, you might want to talk with the person that you think was offended, uh, asking, what are your thoughts about what just happened? And um, being a sounding board, uh, because your perception might not necessarily be that person's perception. That person may not necessarily have felt offended, even though it appeared to you that the person was. So I would think the first thing is to ask that person's perception of what happened and, and how that person feels about that. Um, second thing is, if that person does feel really, really offended, um, you might want to suggest that, um, that the person consider either talking with the immediate supervisor about the situation so that the supervisor can take action to change it. Um, or, uh, in addition, uh, if the person doesn't get um, consideration by the supervisor, then think about some other options. For example, there is um, a uh, Office of Civil Civil Equal Opportunity, e Equal Opportunity okay. Office where uh, the person might want to go and have some private consultations um, uh, and, uh, and have the Equal Opportunity Office outline a few options available to that person, some of which may involve lodging a formal complaint. Uh, I would suggest that. I wouldn't jump to immediate conclusions yeah. and start an action plan yeah. right away. You don't, but, yeah, your opening bid is not a lawsuit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, just as a, a real life example, uh, a former student of mine is a junior officer currently and uh, was having problems with barely implicit bias. Uh, and several of her colleagues could see what was happening. Some of it directed at them, most of it directed at her. And she went to her supervisor. Her colleagues who also saw were willing to stand up and say, yes, um, this is actually what happened and this is how it looked. And it does seem to be a broader pattern. And so they were willing to stand up and be allies. Um, and they may, you know, it may be that you want to go in with the person or you, you know, my friend, you know, if you don't believe me, you can talk to Jim, he was there. And so being willing to stand by and stand up for. But I think the point, find out where they want to go. But yes, be there for them. And um, it will give their voice that much more strength and credibility. Mm -hmm. One last question and is it to the ambassador on my left. <laughs> and then we will. Uh, Mark Storella with the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. Um, Jim and I worked together 30 years ago in Paris, yeah, something Paris. like that, like yeah. a long time ago. Um, I'd like to ask how you see the advantages for the United States in the conduct of our foreign policy 
of presenting a diverse face to the world very broadly. And then very particularly, how do you think senior managers, ambassadors, DCMs, section leaders, um, DASs and on down, how can they maximize that advantage uh, in the years ahead? Great. I think um, the, uh, the key advantage of moving forward on diversity, at least in the foreign policy context, is to, without having a, a big uh, kind of a foghorn, uh, not foghorn, but a loudspeaker, a bullhorn, and yelling out to the world that, you know, we are a diverse society and we are this and we are that, is to simply do it. Um, uh, and by example and by our behavior, we can be very effective in counting, uh, countering rather, some negative experiences that our younger Foreign Service officers have experienced. For example, uh, one or two Pickering fellows doing consular work, consular work in um, the Caribbean uh, ran into some difficulties with applicants at the window and were told, well, you're no help to me. I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to a real American. And by a real American, they meant someone with blonde hair and blue eyes. Okay? Um, when you bring that back to leadership, uh, DCMs and ambassadors have uh, a lot of room to decide or have a, an impact on the the uh, composition of their staff. One of the easiest things to do is to request an intern, a summer intern, or you know, sometime during the academic year uh, from the Pickering program, or the Wrangell program, or the Payne program, or even if from none of those programs, <coughs> then certainly from colleges and universities around the country and make it plain that um, to HR that this is what is wanted at post. That's not to say that every intern should be uh, from a diverse community, but, you know, uh, some representation from diverse communities. And then as with a new Foreign Service officer starting out at post, make sure that that intern uh, has an opportunity to accompany uh, some of the embassy diplomats on calls at the foreign ministry, the economics ministry, the finance ministry, um, and do the note taking and, uh, and, and have the, uh, the foreign service officer that that person accompanies help that in turn to develop a good reporting cable you know, so that some practical benefit, professional benefit, comes out of that internship experience. And if it's a good one, and if it's thought through and planned well, you'll have a potential candidate for the Foreign Service coming out of this. Well, with the Pickerings and the Wrangles, you have that anyway, yeah? I think within the State Department, uh, the same thing can be done. I think uh, heads of bureaus can be far more proactive in ensuring that uh, that they have a diverse staff. And I mean diverse in, in the full sense of the word. Uh, gender, uh, ethnicity, religion, geographic uh, origins um, throughout the country and so on. Because the idea is you don't just, you know, you, you often hear we want a foreign service that looks like all of America. Well, that's nice. But what you really want is a foreign service that has a diversity of ideas. And so you want to make sure that you have a student whose origins are from upstate New York, from areas where, are, where the, the uh, methamphetamine trade is very rampant 
and where kids are looking for an opportunity to move away from that and do good things. Um, you want to make sure that you have representation, and we don't in sufficient numbers, from uh, indigenous American communities where we've done a very poor job of recruiting. Um, you know, and in that way, when you have representation that is naturally in the composition of an embassy, whether uh, among the professional foreign service officers or among the interns or both, and you include, because we want inclusiveness as well as diversity, um, you include uh, these uh, employees in the embassy's deliberations, in the embassy's representational functions, uh, foreigners will see that, ah, you know, the U.S. isn't just about talking about this. They, they really mean it. But more importantly, to go back to the first uh, kind of uh, problem area that I mentioned, um, you begin to change foreign uh, perceptions and understanding of what an American is, not just a person, you know, uh, who uh, is a Caucasian American, but they're beginning to see people from uh, a widely diverse area and you're beginning to include in your deliberations experiences and uh, insights from people who come from vastly different experiences. You're getting kind of multiple parallax views on uh, challenges, uh, foreign policy challenges, uh, both uh, that are deliberated in Washington or even overseas based on differing backgrounds, different ways of thinking about things. And in my own mind, that's a, a better way of, um, of uh, using inclusiveness to, to try to advance our interests beyond uh, the point where we have people who look like the rest of America. I think that is a superb point to end on. And Ambassador Gadsden, sir, Jim, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> very much for I think a tremendous conversation and it was a pleasure and an honor to be able to host you this afternoon. So thank you. Thank very you. Much.